I mean, you guys sound good. <laughs> Sounds really good. Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John chapter 14? We're going to use this text as kind of a launching point to kind of delve into some other texts this morning. We typically, so I said, you know, I set it up in a weird way, saying today was going to be weird in one sense. Uh, this is what I mean by weird. Um, we're spending these first two weeks really concentrating, recalibrating on what are, what are we doing here as a community. And so last week we looked at what is our responsibility in Katy, Texas, specifically in this zip code with these neighbors that we're around all the time, what is our responsibility? And we said our responsibility is to bless them, to bless the mess out of people. And if we're going to be known for anything, it needs to be that for someone on the outside. People who, who are thinking about other people, who are praying for them, who are caring for them, who are loving them. And I'm talking about caring for Christians. I'm talking about, I'm talking about non-Christians. I'm talking about people that are nice, people that are mean. It doesn't matter. Our call, our role is to bless them. And we use the acronym BLESSING. Because it's easy, right? And so what do we, how, do we, how does Haven as a community treat outsiders? And I don't mean outsiders in a derogatory way whatsoever. I just mean people that haven't yet experienced our community. We bless them. We begin by praying for them. We listen to them. We eat with them. We, we serve them. We share them. We invite them to things that we're doing. We navigate the, the normal mundane rhythms of our life to where we're interacting with the same people over and over again. And then we also, we also share the gospel with them. We gospel. We tell the good news that Jesus has come to liberate us from sin and from death. There really is no better news that you can tell another human being. And so we do those things. That's how we treat people on the outside. That's what we must be known for, blessing other people. So this week, we get selfish in one sense. I say selfish. That's radically different than what we'll talk about. But nevertheless... What, that's what our community looks like as we engage with people outside the community. Well, what does it look like for our community to engage within the inside? If we're known for blessing people on the outside of our community, what would our community be known for inside of the community? I read a book back in some point in time. And so most of the stuff that comes from today's whatever this is going to be, I've derived it, no, 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 I have plagiarized it from that book. And the book is by Dave Ferguson, it's called Hero Making. And so if you want a copy of it or, or you hear something, you're like, hey, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, I would love to get you that, put that book in your hands or, uh, I don't know, electronically send it to you somehow. Or whatever, right? But, but it's a great book and just know a lot of the material, this, none of this is really original to me. And I think if Dave were here, he would say none of it's original to him, but it really originates in Jesus himself. Because what we're going to talk about this morning is this idea of not being the hero of the story of Haven, but in fact actually being hero makers in the process. See, there's a vast difference between being a hero and being a hero maker. And so look at me at John 14. We, we've looked at this from another uh, viewpoint when we were going through the book of John. But I want to come back to this for our intent this morning to kind of frame what in the world, why we're talking about this, why this should be the way in which people inside the community of Haven view the community of Haven. Look at verse 12, John chapter 14, verse 12. This is, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And then here's the terrifying part. And I, I'm going to be just straight up honest with you. This next thing that Jesus says, I have no idea really what to do with it. It does not fit into any of my theological categories very neatly. I looked at this on Sunday, last Sunday, knowing that we were going to talk about it this Sunday. I opened up my Bible where my dog chewed, right? True story, yes. I laid it on my desk, and I left it open all week long so that every time I walked back you know, to my room or kitchen or wherever I was going that had to pass, where I passed my Bible, I had to think about this verse. I had to think about these verses and what in the world Jesus is saying here. Listen to what he says. If you believe in me, the one who believes in me also will do the works that I do 
and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we, we are so thankful that you have made yourself known and that just like Ian said earlier, Lord, and, and that we sang about, you're not a grump in the sky. You're not a Scrooge you know, who's waiting to just pounce on us whenever we do something wrong. Lord, but you're perpetually over and over again being patient and long-suffering with us and caring about us and giving us chance after chance and forgiveness, making it readily available for us. And so, Father, as we think about what you're doing in the world today, we, we need to repent for wanting to be in control of that. I know I do. So, Father, this morning for the next couple of minutes, can we talk about what it would look like not to be the hero of the story that you're telling in this world, but in fact, maybe to be hero makers of the story you're telling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone dreams, everyone has dreams that they want to accomplish, right? Everyone does. It doesn't matter if you're the smallest or youngest person in the room or you're the oldest and largest person in the room. I don't know where that was going, but everyone has dreams. And typically when we have these dreams about work, about family, about relationships, we have these, we envision these things and we're always at the center of them, right? We're the hero in these dreams that we have, these works that we want to accomplish. And I don't think that that's, that's all bad. I think for, for all of the answers to why, that we have as to why we have dreams like that, I, mean, I think it's okay. I think it's okay that there's this, there's this desire inside of us to be a hero, to be a part of this story that's bigger than us, to contribute to the world in a way in which is impactful for multiple different people, including ourselves. And so let me pause for a second. Let me just ask you this. Like, what is, what is your dream? Right? Like, you know, you know, initially you hear people say that and stuff like that, and you think, well, you know, I, I want to be super rich. I want to have a nice car, like the Batmobile or, you know, something like that. Which is funny, you know, but no, but really, like, what's behind that? Like, okay, so you do have all the money in the world, right? You are filthy rich. Like, then, then what? Because those are, those are all surface dreams, right? Those are all dreams. Those are vehicles that help us get to our real dreams. And what I'm asking you is this. What is your dream? Like, what's your real dream? If you could contribute, or let's put it like this, you know, because... If, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, whether you've been a Christian a long time or you're a brand new Christian, all of us have these dreams. And here's my conviction, my deep conviction, is that that's not by accident. You know, the evolutionary process can explain some things, and it's captivating in some regards, I guess, but it cannot explain why in the world we have these dreams so deep inside of us. Science can't do it. Metaphysics begins to touch on it a little bit, but really... My conviction really is this, that the Bible explains to us why we have these dreams. Because someone, God himself, has given us these dreams. These works that he wants us to accomplish. You know, the hope of every Christian is this. And if you're not a, if you're not a Christian today, I hope that you hear me. And if you are a Christian, I hope that you just relish in this fact for a second. You know, the hope of every Christian really is this, that one day when we leave this world, we will be greeted by a loving father who cares for us because of the work that his son has done on our behalf. And he will look us square in the eyes, and he will say, completely delighted, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we hear that, and it's so sweet, and it is sweet, and it's so beautiful. And it's like, just some, some days, depending on the day, it's like, man, I want to get there a lot faster. But here, here's, here, here, think about it from this angle for a second. If you can imagine God himself saying that to you, what I want you to think about is this. What work is he referring to that you did? So the beautiful thing happens when we think of it like that. We think about, we read what he says, but if we think, think, think about what, what work was I doing to, to make him say that? And the beautiful thing that occurs is there's this ripple effect. It's invisible, so you can't really see it. I can see it because I can see your faces and your eyes. But everyone has a different idea of what that work is. Why? Why? because we all have dreams. 
We all have goals. We all have ways in which we want to leave our mark on this world. Ways in which we want to collaborate. Ways in which we want to impact society for the better. My conviction is that those don't just come randomly, but they come from God himself. He's given us those dreams, those gifts, those passions, those desires, those talents. And he wants us to use them. But, you know, gifts or being a hero, being having dreams, it's hard because they don't always come to pass. And also, a lot of the times, even, being, even if you are to be the hero of your story, right? even if you are to contribute the way that you want to contribute, it's still severely limited. You know what I mean? It's still a limited amount of work that you can do in, in one lifetime. You only have one lifetime. I only have one lifetime. So either way, as much as you impact the world or as little, it will always be limited. There will always be more work than life. You with me? There will always be that factor, that case. That will always be reality. So one of the questions we have to ask is, how can we maximize our impact? Well, it's not easily done because it's a shift. It's a shift in what we believe I think most when we think about our dreams. It's a shift away from I'm going to be the hero of my dream to instead I'm going to be the hero maker of my dream. I'm going to make heroes. I'm going to stop trying to be the hero. It's a completely inverted way of thinking, which is difficult and it's hard. And so some of you will say immediately, which you should. Um, Actually, let's do this first. I told you, it's going to be weird. (laughs) Around you somewhere, there is a card. A big old card, a small card, I'm not sure what kind of, big old card, like a three by 800 or something. It's, thank you, Andy. <clears throat> On that card, this is what I want us to do. We're gonna do we are going to do an exercise together. And it doesn't matter if you are, kids can do this, big kids can do this, everyone can do this. This is, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take 10 seconds, 10 Mississippis, I'm going to grab my drink behind me. So by the time I walk from here to get my drink, that's how much time you have. I want you to write down, I want you to draw a picture of, I want you to somehow communicate on that card, what is your dream? If you were to stand before God and him say, or let's, maybe maybe this is another way. Good and faithful servant, what work are you doing? Or here's another way we can think about it. When Paul in the book of Ephesians in in chapter 2 talks about our salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. It's all based on what Christ has done for us on our behalf. And then in verse 10 he says something really, really, really odd, like encouragingly odd though. He says in verse 10 that we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. So if that is true, there is a work, there is a dream inside of you that is begging to be released in the world. What is that work? Okay, write it down. All right, you got it? If you don't, it's okay. Maybe it'll come to you a little bit later. That's the beauty of this exercise as well. Some people have a very clear picture what their dream is. Some people, it's not as clear, and that's okay. And as you'll see, there's ways in w- that we can uncover that even today. All right, second. Here's, this is what I want you to do. Underneath your dream, either your picture or your sentence or your word or whatever, underneath that, I want you to write down, in your best estimation, How many people, because if it's a good work, and it's something God's called you to do, it's going to affect people for the good, for the better. Underneath that, I want you to write down how many people you think you could influence you doing that work. Maybe it's six people, maybe it's 600 people, whatever it is. And if you need pens, there's some pens over here in the back as well. Write down how many people. Got it? Six, six hundred, eight million. 
You've written down your dream. You've written down how many people you think you, you could influence in that dream, with that dream, with that work that God's given you to do. Lastly, I want you to do this, because I don't want to take for granted what John writes here. And we're going to talk more in more detail about how to think, we, how to understand this better. But here's what Jesus says, that the work that he's given you to do is going to be great. So this is, this is what I want us to consider. A lot of times, our dreams are too small. Now listen, I'm not like some, listen, if you... If you don't know anything else about me, know this. Like, the, I, I am not uh, the, the, like, this is not a motivational seminar, right? I'm not trying to get, you know, get you into something here, right? Like, I'm not trying to pump you up, and, and, and that's not what's happening at all. But the reality is this. A lot of times, our dreams are too small. Because if it's a work that God has given you, the potential behind that is catastrophic in a good way. It's big. It's really big. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that number of people you think that you can influence, and I want you to multiply it by 100. And then something happens in your brain. Something happens in my brain. When you do that, immediately, what's your first thought? No way. It's too many people. That's too many people to try to impact. You know, whether your thing was mentoring high school girls or whether your thing was working at a soup kitchen or whether your thing was playing music, whatever it is, you had a number in mind. I said multiply it because it was too small. And now all of a sudden your first thought is there's no way. This cannot happen. This is way too many people. And my friends, that's precisely the point. As long as you are captain of your dream, as long as you are the hero, it is not possible. Which means we have to change the way that we think about our dreams. Your dream is not for you to just indulge in by yourself, but it's actually given so that you can invite other people inside into that and empower them and make heroes out of them. Multiplication has to occur for those to even slightly be even slightly a possibility. So important. So to go from a church, and I can confidently say this, here's what we have to do, in, in my humble opinion. We have got to go from a church with heroes, which we do. Man, uh, how do you say it? Like per, cap, per capita, per whatever, like per capita. For as amount of people that we have, the caliber of people, you know, sitting, looking at me right now, is just astronomical. We are a church full of heroes. But we've got to make a shift from being heroes to being hero makers. Not focusing on ourselves, but focusing on the people. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what many of you are thinking. Well, you know, that's nice and sweet, you know. But you're a pastor, that's your job, that's what you do. You know, you think about that stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. But listen, I wore my red shirt today. I wore my, I wore my red shirt today because, thank you, thank you, thank you. Was that Quincy? <laughs> I wore my red shirt today because, you know, it's on theme, right? Hero Maker. This is one of my favorite shirts that I have. Um, it was from a conference that I didn't get, I didn't get to go to because Elisa's gallbladder attacked her last year. But <laughs> nevertheless, I, so I wore my, my Hero Maker shirt, but I also wore it because it's red. And see, I don't wear red shirts on Sunday mornings unless I have a jacket on because, believe it or not, I get really anxious talking in front of people. Super. Like my anxiety goes through the roof. Because I care what people think about me. I want to be smart. I want to be good looking. I want to be all of these you know, different things. I want you to view me a certain way. And I know the probability of you viewing me that way is, is sometimes very not going to happen. And so because of that, I sweat a lot. Like particularly in the armpit region. Right? Like all the time. A lot. You know why? Because I'm, I'm finite. I'm a human being. Like, I am, I, I am not a guru. I'm not the savior. Like, I'm not, I'm not Jesus. I mean, in a very real way, I'm, I'm no different than any person in this room. Like, we are all on the same page. We all have dreams. We all have ambitions. We have things that we want to accomplish for God. 
and all of us are equal. Like, I'm, I am very much completely and utterly dependent on God's grace and his mercy and what he's accomplished on my behalf through Jesus. And so th- t- and today, this is not at all, this is not at all, I'm, I'm not standing here saying, man, I've got it all figured out. This is great. This is, this, is the, this is the next ticket. No, no, no. I am very much sitting down with you as just a sweaty dude. A sweaty dude who wants to see God do miraculous things through other people. I promise you that's it. That's the catch. There's no sign up at the end kind of deal. So, it is freezing in here. So I'm going to put this back on. But nevertheless... So the question is this, how in the world do we go from being a culture or a community of heroes to a community of hero makers? Well, I think that Dave Ferguson in his book, Hero Making, uh, has given us really, really great principles, practices about how to go from being the hero to being a hero maker. And so that's what I want to look at today. There are five practices to being a hero maker. And the first one, the first one is this, it's thinking about multiplication, Multiplication thinking. So in a summary, multiplication thinking is this. It's going from, I think ministry happens through my ministry, to, I think ministry happens through multiplied leaders. This is a massive shift, but it is absolutely through and through biblical. It begins with Jesus. Jesus died, is buried, resurrects. What's the first thing that he does when he comes back to his disciples? In Acts 1.8, it sets the tone for the rest of the church history and even current day. What does he do? He says, you guys wait in Jerusalem till the power comes, which we'll get back into a little bit later. But when the power comes, you will be my witnesses. Think about it for a second. Jesus can do anything, all things, And yet the program, the process by which he is changing the world is by using people. Jesus could have come in like like Superman and just redeemed the world, fixed it, made it all right again. But that's not what he does. He says, hey, John, Peter, come with me. I'm going to show you some stuff. He tells the disciples in the book of Acts, look, you guys are going to be my witnesses. This is the program. I have made you, I have created you, I have put a dream inside of you, and I want you to run with it as I empower it. He's the source of power, but he uses people as the vehicle to change this world upside down. We have got to stop thinking that our ministry, our personal ministry, or even our church, is the end-all, be-all. It's just not true at all. Because Jesus multiplies leaders, and we have to always be thinking about multiplication. So, so how, how do you even start thinking like that? Because it's, I think that's just so adverse to most church culture things that we hear today, period. We start thinking about it by asking the right questions. There are questions that will lead to multiplication, and there are questions that will not lead to multiplication. And so there are, there, Ferguson talks about several different levels of questions that churches ask. And the first level of question are churches that are declining ask. Questions like, how do I keep this ministry running when no one wants to volunteer? How do I even get volunteers? Or where can we cut, where can we cut budget items in order to pay the, pay the bills? Now again, these aren't bad questions, and they need to be asked. But when these are the only questions asked, decline is approaching. But then there's a second level of questions that leads to plateauing. Not necessarily declining, but just plateauing, just existing. How can I train someone to take my place? Because I'm burnt out, I'm tired, I want to step down. How can I get someone to replace me? How can I make this the best church possible for the people that, that, are, that keep coming? It's a terrible question. Then there's a third level of questions that, lead, that start spiking the growth, just a bit. And these are questions like, should my leadership or should the way I interact with people in the community change based on our size now? Like, there are community size dynamics that about, right? Different size of organizations that they may need to change. And that's a good question. It's a good question to ask. Or how can we help newcomers get to know other people and feel more connected as the community begins to grow? Those are, that's a great question. Those questions lead towards growth. 
And I will, I will define and defend a particular definition of growth in a bit, but for now, just take it by faith. These questions are not bad, necessarily, and they all need to be asked. But here's the problem. Here's what you run up against very quickly and rapidly. If you notice, all of these questions are very inwardly focused. And they're inwardly focused. They're, 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 they're maintenance questions. How do I fix this as if this is the end-all, be-all? Forgetting the fact that, that, that there, there is a possible future that is greater than, than, the future, than, the, than the current present right now. You still have to deal with these questions. You still have to have volunteers in the nursery. You still have to have coffee on Sunday mornings, right? You still have to put the chairs up. So you keep asking those questions. But you always ask them and answer them in light of thinking about multiplication. How do we multiply this? So the last two levels of questions are incredibly important. The first one has to, the first set has to do with reproducing. And if we are not asking these questions, we're probably not making heroes. Because the more we ask these questions, the more heroes we necessarily have to have to fill in the gaps. Questions like, how can we be proactive in planting a new church? Why is that a great question? Because it forces us then to think about all of the resources it would take to go plant a new church and go f- recruit and find and train. Should we offer additional service times? Your questions like that, those, those are reproducing. How do we reproduce what God is already blessing in a different venue? And then lastly, the last set of questions that we have got to ask is really this. What are the practices of a hero maker that I, that I can apply right now? Out of these five practices that we'll go through, like which of these can I apply right now? How can I start, stop trying to be the hero of my story and begin being a hero maker? Questions like how can I carve out time to disciple or mentor other people? That's a huge question that yields bountiful amounts of fruit. How can we get involved with other churches that want to plant other churches and so, so forth and so forth? Questions about multiplication. It really matters what questions we're asking. It really matters. So, I want you to look at your card for a second. Look at it. Stare at it. And I want you to think about how, if you were to not be the hero of that dream, if you were to be a hero maker, if you were going to invite other people into your dream to see it, to see it yield results, what are some of the questions that you would have to answer? What are some of the questions you would have to ask? Are they level one questions? Are they concerned only with the maintenance of that particular work? Or are they concerned with the future of it, the multiplication aspect of it? And so, so forth, so much and so forth. The second, second practice is this. So multiplication thinking is first. Second is this. It's my favorite one, permission giving. It's my favorite one. It's also the hardest one. Permission giving is something that has lost its uh, luster, I, I think you, you could say. Particularly in you know, churches that I have been a part of because of me. I have not done this well. And I'm growing to love it very much. Permission giving is simply this. It's, it's going from, I see, I see what God can do through me and my leadership, to, see, to saying this, I can see what God can do through others and I let them know about it. There's this, uh, I mean, you see Jesus doing it all the time. My favorite is in Matthew 4 when he first sees Peter and Andrew. And he says, hey, drop your, your fishing poles because I want you guys to come be fishers of men. Now look, don't, I'm not being theologically weird here, right? There's not, they're, they're not like these blue chip, you know, draft, uh, not draft. They're not these blue chip re- recruit, you know, people. And Jesus is like, oh man, I got to have you guys or my thing's going to fail. No, no, that's not it at all. He sees them and he sees what he can do in them. And they can't see it, and they don't even know it. They're like, no, no, we're very happy just, just here catching, you know, catching our fish. He said, no, no, you don't, understand. you don't understand what I have for you. You want to be a part of it, come do it. And so Jesus has something that is called an I see in you conversation. It's where the person says to someone else, hey, I see you doing this. I think you would be really great at this. There is nothing more powerful than when a human being looks you in the eyes and says, man, I've noticed you, 
and I've noticed you're really good at this. And I think God has really, really gifted you in this way. Would you consider doing this? Can you imagine being approached to do something, you know, that maybe, maybe you want to do, maybe you don't want to do, but like that's how they lead off with it? It's like, pff, all right, well, I'll at least give it a try. It's I see in you conversations. I smelled like just straight up boy B.O. And wrestling mats. And like the cleaner that they use on the wrestling mats. But my friends invited me to go to church with them at Westland Baptist over here on Grand Parkway. And I thought, okay, fine, I'll go. But the, the real kicker was we were going to play Halo after, right? So that was, okay, I'm about to go dominate some noobs in this thing. So I go, and, and Halo got me there, if I'm honest. Jimmy Taylor kept me there. Jimmy Taylor, now the associate pastor over there with, with Roy Meadows, a man that I deeply, deeply love very much. Jimmy gave the worst youth night talk I've ever heard in my life. It was god-awful. And I mean that respectfully. <laughs> it was bad. But for some reason, oh, I know the reason, because I was incredibly arrogant, right? I went up to him and I said, hey, I just, you seemed like, I said something, I don't remember, just fill in the blank. Some arrogant, some 16-year-old would say, right? Way out of line. I tell him, uh, and then I said, follow it up with this. Hey, you know, like, I've been a Christian a long time, and I, I'm, I'm, I like teaching and stuff like that. So if you ever want someone to teach, and he's like, oh, perfect. This could have gone two ways, right? He could have kicked me out immediately. He said, don't ever come back here again. Or he could have said, well, you're up next week. So he did the latter. So I said, okay. I never taught before in my life. So I prepared all week long for the most glorious teaching of God's word you could ever imagine. And it was just terrible. Like, I don't remember verbatim everything I said, but I know deep in my heart, I will stand before God one day and he will just look at me and I will have to answer for things that came out of my mouth that night. And I remember just feeling like so frustrated and so, so down. And I remember like clockwork, he came over to me, he put his arm around me and he said, man, that was awesome. And I was thinking in my head, no, that wasn't. And then he said this, you know what? I think you have a gift. He says, I think I can see you doing this. I said, you can? He said, yeah, why don't you come meet with me next, next, next Tuesday? And before, we'll kind of go over and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, give you some feedback and stuff. And he said, he said, I want to, and then he said these words, I want to invest in you. And in a moment, my heart just exploded. Because Jimmy saw something in me that I didn't really see in myself at all. But he said, no, 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 I can see you doing this. I can see that God has gifted you and talented you, given you talents and this ability. You need massive amounts of work and still do. But at the same time, like, I can see you doing this. And so from that point forward, like, that changed the whole trajectory of my life. I mean, I could tell you lots of different stories about people who have, who have had those I see in you conversations with me. Lots of different people, you know. My wife daily has those with, you know, and, and you know, other people as well. Have you ever had someone have a conversation with you like that? I hope that you have. If you haven't, I hope this becomes the place where you get those. We have got to be a culture of seeing things in people that they can't see themselves and telling them over and over and over and over and over again. Because God has created you as his workmanship. You have a dream. You have work that he has planned for you before the foundation of the world for you to walk in that you one day can stand before him and he can say, well done. And he uses the church to help people find those things out. In theory, that sounds beautiful and amazing, and it is in real life too. It's also incredibly difficult because if we're going to be a community that is having I see and you conversations, if we're going to be a community that's giving permission, here's what that means. Just because you see something in someone doesn't mean they're going to be a rock star the first time they do it. Which means this. You're going to have to, we're going to have to endure lots and lots of mess-ups. Lots and lots of people trying things out and then not working out so well, but then they get better at it, or they realize, I just do not want to do that. 
type of deal. We have to be patient with that. We have to be okay with that. We have to give permission and then let the chips fall where they may. Trusting that God's going to clean it all up in the end. Does that make sense? We've got to be patient. We have to be kind. We have to let people fail. We have to be a a safe place where people can try things and fail. and, And be encouraged all the more. We've got to think about multiplication. We've got to think about giving permission. These are two of the most crucial aspects of being a hero maker. Multiplying thinking, permission giving. Look at your card. Who can you think of right now as you think about your dream, the work you want to do? Who is someone that is in your life, in your family, in your friend group, at your gym, whatever? Like, Who is someone that you could go up to right now and say, man, I think that you're really good at blank. Like, I see you doing something like blank. Would you join me as I try to do this? It may be a total disaster. We may fail miserably, but man, we're going to have fun doing it. Would you consider trying that? Do you have people in your mind you can think of? Give permission. And here's what happens. As you give permission, you enter into relationships with people, particularly, which is the third, the third strategy of multiplication, of disciple making, excuse me, of hero making, is disciple making. Like, John Piper in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, is one of the greatest works on missions I've ever read. In the first sentence in the first chapter, it's probably one of the greatest sentences ever written. He says this, missions exist because worship doesn't. You see, the goal of the church is worship. Like, that's the goal, that's the end-all, be-all goal of the church is worship. Discipleship helps us and helps invite other people into being worshipers. That's what it is. It's a process by which we are strengthening one another, training one another for this moment's ministry, but also for tomorrow's ministry. It's the legacy that the church, church leaves behind. It's the vehicle by which we make worshipers. So disciple multiplying really is this. It's going from I share, I share what I've learned in ways that add more followers to I share what I've learned in ways that multiplied disciples. Here, Jesus in John 3 does something really interesting. In John chapter 3, and this is like not a popular verse. No one's putting this on their coffee cup or anything like that, right? But like behind it, I think, is really crucial, especially for this conversation. And it says, after Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them. Now watch this. And they were baptizing. Right? They plural. When we think about discipleship, I think we have kind of like a messed up view of discipleship. If I may be so bold as to say, like our, dis- our view of discipleship, I don't know if it was Jesus' view of discipleship. We think of discipleship, we think of like some new book we're going to read, you know, or like some cool bar we're going to hang out and talk about theology or something like that, right? Like that, that's, those are good things. And, and listen, I, I'm, all, I'm more pro-theology than than, mo- than I'm very pro-theology, right? Very pro-theology. At the same time, discipleship is not merely just a transfer of theology from one person to another. It's a transfer of life from one person to another. It's a different way of living. It's living with people relationally, caring for them, showing them the ropes per se. Like discipleship is not just merely a data transfer, but it's a life transfer And if you're going to multiply disciples, this is what Jesus does. Jesus says, hey, he doesn't say, sit down, I'm going to teach you all of the Nicene beliefs about about baptism. Like, that's not what he does at all. He says, no, no, we're going to go baptize people, come with me, and oh, by the way, you're going to do it too. You're going to get your hands dirty as well. Like, it's OJT training to the max. And this is how he does it. And then Paul with Timothy shows us the ramifications of discipleship. Watch it. This is so so beautiful. He says in 2 Timothy 2, he says this. Then you, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others. So there's four generations of this discipleship process coming down. Paul is discipled, then he disciples Timothy, and then what does Paul tell Timothy? Timothy, your discipleship is not complete until you go disciple someone else. 
You go live life with someone else. You show them the ropes. You multiply disciples. And then what happens? Those disciples make disciples. It's four different generations. It's not a class. It's not a book. I mean, the classes are helpful. Books are helpful. But discipleship is a life on life. Let's walk with Jesus together and let's make more of us type of deal. It is the lifeblood of the church. It's what the work of the church is. So how do we do that? Actually, it's not much more different than what you already experience probably like at your jobs. I mean, really, if I, if, if I may be so bold, like discipleship biblically is not much, not much different than kind of like your management uh, programs that you go through at work. Like, what does it look like? Well, I mean, here's five basic, basic principles about how to make a disciple. You choose someone that you like and you get along with, and you start doing stuff with them. That's discipleship. You start, doing, you start living as a Christian in front of this person, with this person, and you talk about it. So, 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 so like, one, one, one small paradigm could be something like this. You have something that you want to do. Look at your cards. All of you have something that you want to do. So here's how you disciple. You look at the card and say, I want to do this. I'm going to find someone to do it with me. If you're a real baller, you say, oh, I'm going to find two people to do it with me. You find two people to do it with you, and then you say this. I want you to come with me. I'm going to do the work. I want you to watch, and then after, we're going to talk about it. Some time goes by, and then you say, okay, I'm going to do it, but this time I want you to help me do this work, and then we're going to talk about it. And then some more time goes by, and you say, you know what? I'm going to take a backseat this time. You do the work. I'm going to watch. And then we'll talk about it. And then over the course of time, the hope is this, that that person does it all by themselves. And they have someone else watch. And you stand in the back and you just cheer. Keep going, keep going, keep going. That's discipleship. That's discipleship. That's making heroes that's hero making, multiplication thinking, giving permission, making disciples. The fourth and the fifth, quickly. The fourth one is this gift activating. One thing that we do really poorly as a church in the West is celebrate the gifts of other people. Why? Because typically, the gifts that are popular, you know, we, we want them. <laughs> I'm not happy that you're, you're good at what you do. I wish I was you because I want to do it. If you want to crush a church community, just keep perpetuating that idea. Now listen, it's hard. It's hard to celebrate the gifts of other people, but it must be done. One of the practical ways in which we do that here is by trying to co just commission everybody. Right? Like Anyone who has anything worth celebrating, we want to celebrate with you and we want to send you out. People who go on mission trips, we're going we're gonna to bless them, send them out. Teachers going back to, to teach, right? The most hostile mission field in the world. You know, we want to bless them and, and send them out. You know, stuff like that. We want to, bl we want to bless people, and we want, pe we want to be, feel satisfied when other people are being blessed by God. And we want, to we want to bless them. We want to activate those gifts that God has, that God has given them. And the last is this, and I could spend a lot more time on this, and I, but I won't, I promise. But it's this. It's going from thinking about our individual church to thinking about God's kingdom instead. This is the hardest one for me personally, just to be honest. This is the hardest one. Because I want this, I want Haven to be everything. Right? I want it to be this monstrosity of, of an organization. But the more I read the Bible, the more I'm just like, I don't know, I, I, that, that's, that's sinful. And you don't have to look much further than the Lord's Prayer, Right? When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, what does he say? He says, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is nothing about Haven in there. It is nothing about Kingsland Baptist in there, nothing about Westland, nothing about First Baptist Katy. There's nothing in there about those churches. It's all about the kingdom, his kingdom. Churches get off oftentimes, and I can say this because I've been a part of church for a long time. So I'll put it like this. I've been off for a long time because I've had the wrong scoreboard when it comes to counting success in the church. You know, my, the first Astros game I ever went to, it was, uh, 
I don't remember when. It was a long time ago. But, but it's when the killer bees were there, right? So it was fun to watch the killer bees, Biggio, Bagwell, and all the other bees, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, they, I mean, they, they lost miserably, like, so, but the killer bees were there, so it was fun. So, so, but I remember it was the first time I, I like, did the scorecard. Have you ever done one of those, the baseball scorecard? I mean, you, like, you record every stat, no demand, right? It's like how many balls got pitched to this batter, how many strikes to that one, what kind of pitch, blah, blah, blah. You're filling all this stuff. There's, by the time the, the game is over, if you keep up with it, it's like it's just this, this tremendous amount of information. But at the end of the day, there's two boxes that matter. How many runs did the home team have? How many runs did the away team have? Those are the only two boxes that matter. In church world, we calculate a lot of stuff all the time. A lot of time. And it's also very telling about what we believe about what success looks like in the church. We have two boxes in the church. They come by different names a lot. Bucks and butts. Uh, dimes and or nickels and noses. Uh... You know, I mean, how many, how many people do you have on Sunday? How much money do you have in the bank? If it's, if it's high, I guess, then you're a success. If not, then you stink, right? I cannot tell you how many times a day, that's an exaggeration. I can't tell you how many times a minute someone is asking me, how many people you got? How much money do you have in the bank? Are those good questions? Yes, they're good questions. Do they define the success of a church? Or may, may I put it like this? Do they define the faithfulness of a church? Absolutely not. The faithfulness of a church is not in how many people they can gather in a building on a particular Sunday morning. It's not. It's not at all. Faithfulness, faithfulness is, are you producing disciples that are saying, God, you receive the glory, and we're going to make as many of us as possible? That's success. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways to count success or to calculate it, but if we're not gauging by the right metrics, man, we will get off on some crazy, some crazy pursuit of, some, of something crazy. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's faithful. I don't think, that's what, I don't think that that's what Jesus instilled in us and left for us to get bogged down in those things. Because here's the thing, and this is what I'm convinced of through and through, and I've become more and more convinced of it. If we counted two things for the rest of our lifetime as a church, whether that be a million years or two months, I think God would deem us faithful if we counted two things. And that's this. How many disciples are we making who are making disciples? And how many leaders do we have that are not just showing up, but they're in the game? Because here's what I'm convinced of more and more. Like on the baseball scorecard, Ultimately, at the end, you have, you know, the two boxes that matter. Which box has more runs? But a lot of times, you can, you can still track all the other things because they kind of tell the story of how the runs got to be what they are. But ultimately, the two boxes fix everything else. If we focus on making disciples that make disciples and having leaders that are leading and engaging and not just merely gathering not just coming on Sunday, but being a part of it, the rest of us is going to take care of itself. I'm fully, fully convinced of that. What in the world is Jesus talking about here in John 14? I don't think you can say it's a, a greatness of quality. When Jesus says, hey, you're going to do greater things, you'll, you'll see, you, you will be a part of greater things. And greater things will he do. I don't think it's a quality thing, right? It's, it's, Jesus is, is pretty high quality in the things that he does, always. And I don't know if it's just merely a quantity thing either, although there is a, a quantity aspect as the church ignites, as it goes past 12 people and a larger church grows from it. Like, yeah, there are more good works happening, occurring. Yeah, sure, so maybe a quality. But here's what the linguists tell us, the professional people who tell us what, what words mean and stuff, they say this, that this word actually has to do with intensity, more so than quality or quantity. Intensity. The way that it's used here. So what Jesus is saying is that the works will be more intense. Well, how is that possible? Well, the way it's possible is because thus far, the disciples are doing great things, seeing Jesus do great things 
before he dies. So they're still living in their old, they're using their, their old software, per se. They're using their old, their, old, their old ways. When Jesus dies and resurrects, something magnificent happens. The same power that raises Jesus from the dead gets poured out into his people, then and now, so that they don't operate under the same software. They don't have the same hardware. They are intensely modified, prone for work, the work, the dreams that God has called them to do. I just got rid of my old Mac this year. It was, it was a sad day, but it was like 10 years old. It worked well, kind of, you know, but I have like these big Bible programs and stuff like on them, and so I would you know, have to open it up, and I'm like, ah, oh. so I go get a drink, pet the dog, you know, go play around a little bit, play Xbox, you know, and like finally, after a while, it, you know, the, the, the wheel will be done spinning, and I'd, I'd be able to work on my computer. I still use the same program today. It's very big, it's very massive. I still use the same program. I still use the same programs. But I got a new computer this year. And the intensity of power that comes in this new software, in this new hardware, is rem remarkable. Same program, intensely more powerful. The guarantee that Jesus gives us is this. I've called you to do great works and I'm going to be with you and fueling you to do these works. And they're going to be intensely, culturally engaging, deeply, deeply satisfying. I think that's what John is saying here. I did a card this week, too. I've done one before several times. And here's what I realized when I did my card this time. There are 16,000 people that live in the zip code. Roughly, if the statistics are correct, roughly 8,000 of those people, in the zip code alone, don't go to church, unchurched, either don't know the story of Jesus, the gospel, or they just don't want anything to do with it, right? My people, those are my kind of people. My dream is to provide a seat for all of those people all 8,000 of them in this city. And what I was realizing in a very intense way this week is that I can never do that. I can absolutely never, I can absolutely never do that. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. The only way it's even fathomable is if I have a tremendous amount of help. And then I got to thinking about your dreams. Because see, our dreams are not in competition with each other. See, the, the people that you're wanting to impact, I'm wanting you to impact. Because they're part of the 8,000. They're part of the 16,000. Like, it's not just about your dream. It's about all of our dreams and how they're connected. But the only way that they get mobilized is if we stop being the hero. Jesus is already the hero. Our role is to be hero makers. Let's pray. God, would you do the impossible this morning as we took a, 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 just a different kind of setting, but to talk about some very profoundly biblical things. And so, Lord, would you do the impossible and would you just awaken our hearts to the grace that we have in Christ? And, Father, would you make that grace so real to us to where we want desperately to mobilize other people to experience that grace as well. That's what this is about. We want to bless those on the outside, Lord, and we want to make heroes on the inside. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.